Okay, we'll get cracking. Um, first of all, welcome to this webinar. Um, thanks very much to Scott, who I'm going to hand over to in a minute for organising this. Um, this is a subject that we've been approached to do more on. Um, I think there was a there was a poll recently along amongst a lot of sports development professionals and governance for sports clubs came up as something that um, sports development officers are sometimes not that keen to delve into too much um, in terms of knowledge and things like that. I think because of the implications, obviously, if you change your club structures and things like that. So um, so we thought we'd engage with um, Ricks and Kay, who have kindly come forward and offered this session tonight um, just to use their expertise and professionalism, basically. So um, my name's Stuart, Stuart Butler from um, Kent Sport. We're the active partnership for Kent and Medway. Um, there's one of us in every county, basically, across the country. So there's lots of us out there. And um, we basically are funded predominantly from Sport England, but also from Kent County Council and a few other sort of project specific funds that come into us um, to deliver things like funding, advice, workshops, allocate funding, school sports, um, club development, health and wellbeing, massive um, route we're going down there now working with housing associations and different partners. So um, it's quite a varied offer, but we wanted to focus on this tonight. So um, We've had clubs that have come to us that have asked for this, that have requested this subject. Some clubs that haven't been able to access or apply for funding because of the way they are set up and structured. So we thought that as a, as a good sort of, you know, good starting point would be to introduce the guys from Ricks and Kay, introduce Scott, um, who can lead us off and um, hopefully enjoy the next hour. There will be a chance for Q&A at the end, I think. Um, Scott will clarify all that. Um, enjoy. Over to you, Scott. Okay, thanks Stuart and thanks for the introductions. Uh, my name is Scott Garner. I am uh, Head of Business Development at Ricks and Kay uh, and have helped put this together this evening. Thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, we've got a great um, session lined up, um, I'm sure. Uh, we've got uh, my colleague Alan Zill, um, who's a corporate partner in Ricks and Kay, who will be providing an introduction into incorporation of sports clubs. We're very pleased also to welcome onto the call this, uh, this evening, Alistair Towler. Uh, from Plummer Parsons Accountants, who is an expert in um, tax and considerations around sport. We work very closely with Plummer Parsons and we're very delighted as well to welcome John Thorpe, who's a trustee um, at the Anstey Village uh, Centre Development, um, who Ricks and Kay work closely with. Uh, he'll be giving us a live um, or a real, a real walkthrough of a case study um, and some uh, info on sports funding around his particular project, which I hope will be really interesting at the end. Um, just a little bit of in, an introduction to Ricks and Kay. I, I think some of you will, will be um, familiar with the firm. Some of you may not be. We're a full service law firm based predominantly in Sussex and Kent. In Kent, our offices are located in Seven Oaks and Ashford. We're full service. We have all of the, all of the corporate services available to businesses. And alongside that, we have a uh, very strong private client offering. And one of our most prominent sectors and, and sector areas of expertise is indeed sports and hence why Kent Sport approached us to put on this session this evening. So I hope you all enjoy. I'm going to hand over to Alan in a moment who will take you through the first part of the, of the session. Just a little bit of housekeeping before I do that. The, the session is being recorded, so we will make the um, recording available to attendees and a few of you who haven't been able to join the session this evening. We will take a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions during the session, please submit those using either the Q&A or the chat function on Zoom. I hope you're all familiar with that. That's pretty straightforward. We will take the Q and A's at the end. If there's an abundance of questions, which we're not be able, which we won't, may not be able to get through um, in its entirety, we will come back to you in one way or another to address your points. And of course, you can always um, contact either Alan, Alastair, or John, and we'll have their their details available for you at the end as well. So that's enough from me. I'm going to um, pass over to Alan, who will take you through the first part of the presentation. Hi, uh, much of my time spent on corporate transactions. I'm a partner in the corporate team at, uh, at Ricks and Kay, uh, but I've always carried on a, a distinct uh, charity not-for-profit practice. And indeed, one of my first jobs when I was uh, doing my training up in London was to set up a charitable foundation for uh, one of the main, one of the well-known high street brands. Uh, since then, uh, I've been doing work in the charity sector, not-for-profit sector, and at Ricks and Kay, I have probably helped uh, 10, 12 or more rugby clubs incorporate. So we've done quite a bit of this work one way or another. Uh, first slide, really, nothing much, just a load of uh, terms, acronyms, 
all of which get used in this uh, sector. Uh, so moving on, uh, I thought it might be helpful if I can get a couple of concepts across. Uh, the first is the distinction between <coughs> the type of entity, the type of entity that we're talking about, and also its status. Uh, the two concepts are quite important really because one is whether or not you're going to have an incorporated or an unincorporated club and regardless of that you may then go on to think about whether you're going to have a particular status uh, that's to say whether you're going to have a be a community community amateur sports club or a charity or indeed whether you're going to have no special status at all so the two there are really quite different concepts uh, I'm going to talk about uh, incorporated or unincorporated first that's to say the sort of entity that the club is uh, what do I mean by incorporated well I mean uh, basically I mean a company a limited company some sort of corporate entity uh, which has its own which is it which is an entity in its own right and the benefit of that is that the liability of its members is limited. Uh, it can sue and be sued in its own name. It can contract in its own name. It can hold property in its own name. And uh, the great benefit is that the committee members in particular, the people who run the club, um, they're not generally liable for, uh, they're not generally liable for the debts of the club. Uh, or uh, unless of course there's some sort of personal wrongdoing with unincorporated unincorporated associations just the normal club uh, frankly they are nothing more than a group of people who've come together uh, there's no limited liability no concept of limited liability uh, all of the individuals involved uh, particularly the committee members uh, are liable for the club's debts uh, however they arise it might be the bill to the brewery it might be liability for accidents uh, so no so personal assets at risk and personally liable uh, this really came to the fore to a great extent back in 2011 i don't know if those recall uh, the uh, incident down in devon there was a major major accident on the M5 picture of it there and uh, why is this relevant well the local rugby club um, was holding a firework display and it was very very foggy and there was some question as to whether the smoke from the fireworks had contributed uh, to the accident to the accident or not uh, the coroner happened to find that the smoke from the fireworks did not contribute to the accident uh, but uh, had it then things may very may, may have been very very difficult at the at the rugby club with personal liability for the committee members uh, if the club wasn't incorporated so that's a an extreme case but it certainly brings it brings it very much to the fore and it's not just accidents it's all contracts uh, leases dilapidations under the leases uh, and uh, these liabilities may go on for a long time uh, and well after the individual has ceased to be involved in the club uh, sport is sport is in, an inherently risky uh, pastime well, certainly some sports rugby cricket horse riding and then of course there are um, very much the four these days uh, the safeguarding issues <coughs> so for those reasons um, much benefit in incorporating if only to protect the uh, personal, if only to protect the committee members and their assets. So put simply, so put simply, um, why incorporate? Well, there we are, your house. Perhaps that's why you want to incorporate, if for no other reason. A uh, quote from the RFU, uh, who are very, very strong on encouraging clubs to incorporate uh, is, would you bet your house on the chance that nothing untoward will ever happen to your rugby club? If you are a committee member and your club is, in is unincorporated, you may be doing just that. So that very briefly is incorporate or unincorporate. And the next question 
is next issue to address is the different statuses uh, of that you can operate under now you could have uh, no particular status that is to say it's just a group of people coming together to play sport you're not looking for any particular tax breaks uh, you're not looking to be a charity just a group of people coming to, together to play to play sport uh, these are the three main ways that you're probably likely to carry on your sports club there are others which i don't intend to go into in any detail such as community interest companies kicks or perhaps a mutual but they're not used to any great extent at all so the steps to incorporation i think are firstly uh, decide to incorporate and then once you've decided that decide whether you want to be just a club no regulation at all or community amateur sports club a bit more regulation or a charity uh, which is most regulated and decide which of those you want to go to once you've decided that you can move on to uh, actually incorporating so let's just talk about just being a club not a community amateur sports club not a charity uh, the interesting ones here I think uh, you can have a restricted membership that's to say you can stop people from joining um, pretty much for no reason unlike a charity or a cask uh, you can play pay, pay players if that's of interest to you uh, many amateur sports clubs do to some extent uh, like to pay something to their top team um, but there's no no tax reliefs available and perhaps uh, grant funding grant, grant funding uh, raising funds and other bodies might be difficult but you get complete freedom to do what you like uh, in the middle if you like are the is a cask uh, a cask uh, less regulation than a charity um, do get some tax breaks probably not as generous as those for a charity Alistair Towler will comment on that a little more I think uh, you can play you can pay players if you wish but not a great deal um, maximum is ten thousand pounds per club per year uh, that's not ten thousand pounds per player it's per club uh, you probably have more luck raising funds from other bodies because you have some you have a status uh, and it's recognized as such uh, and you can you can trade to a limited extent a limited extent within the club uh, the cask is regulated by hmrc only not the charity commission and the other question i suppose is well which sort of sports can uh, apply for the cask and it's those that are uh, recognized uh, by sport england the other more regulated entity is the charity uh, advantages with the charity is that the concept's extremely well understood uh, fundraising uh, from other charitable foundations and obtaining grants might be easier uh, you can't pay the players that's the view and you have to satisfy a couple of tests to be charitable uh, the 2011 act uh, 2011 charities act specifically states that the advancement of amateur sports is charitable but it's a, a fairly restricted definition uh, and it defines sport as meaning sports or games which promote health by involving physical or mental activity uh, so it's uh, somewhat limited uh, and in addition to that you have to prove a public benefit uh, public benefit um, splits into two things one benefit and to public aspect uh, the charity commission have been getting uh, a little hotter on this of late uh, and the idea is that it's got to be beneficial and you've got to be able to prove that it's beneficial rather than just somebody's opinion and the benefits have to outweigh any harm public aspect is it must be of benefit to the public in general or a sufficient or a sufficient section of the public so when you decided the status um, 
what next? Uh, questions to ask. Um, but once you've decided, if you just want to be a sports club and incorporate, don't want any particular tax breaks or any particular special status, then you're probably going to be a, either a company limited by guarantee or a straightforward company with shares. If you go for the uh, medium layer of regulation that become a cask, uh, then it's likely that you're going to be a company limited by guarantee. Uh, if you're a charity, then you can either be a company limited by guarantee or a charitable incorporated organization. Uh, all I would say, all I would say is that registration with the charity commission uh, can take a significant period of time. Uh, and Scott, if we can go on to the next slide, if we could. Uh, methods of the next steps to incorporate, well, First thing really, check the rules of your existing club and comply with any of those in terms of passing the assets on to the incorporated entity. Uh, if you're a cask, then it's a, if you're a cask, then you're doing an application to uh, HMRC. It's a form to fill in and HMRC will form a view as to whether or not you'll meet the qualifications. Uh, if it's to be a company limited by guarantee and a charity then you incorporate the company first uh, company's house and then you submit an application to the charity commission currently applications to the charity commission uh, are meant to be acknowledged within 12 weeks and when i say acknowledged within 12 weeks weeks i mean exactly that and then after that uh, the charity commission can take quite a long time uh, particularly at the moment because they're concentrating on the the various charity applications in respect of COVID. So uh, in summary as to whether to incorporate or not, uh, I think the conclusion is quite simply um, uh, you should and uh, it protects your house assets, personal liability if you do. So thank you for that and I will take uh, questions of course at the end. Hi there, um, my name's Ali. I'm one of the managers at Plum Parsons and I work within the not-for-profit team. I've been working at Plum Parsons for the last 11 years, uh, strictly within the not-for-profit side for the last 10. So you could say that charities and sports clubs sort of are my bread and butter. So over the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I plan to go over a brief bit around some of the year-end requirements, specifically filing requirements, formats of the accounts, external scrutiny, tax considerations and the VAT. So the key thing to remember is all um, entities must file the accounts, uh, prepare accounts, sorry, even if they aren't filed. Generally speaking, this will be in line with your governing document because it may say any specific requirements um, and they must be filed within nine months of the year end at company's house and 10 months for the charity commission. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're a oh, go back. <laughs> if you're a charity and your income is less than twenty five thousand pounds for the year, you don't actually need to file them with the charity commission. They still need to be prepared, but they just don't get filed. When looking at the sort of accounts that you can prepare, there's two ways. There's the receipts and payments, which is the first way. Can you move on, please? Um, which is the far simpler way of doing things. It records just the cash transactions with a separate note of the assets and liabilities. If you are registered with the Charity Commission, they have a uh, predefined format that you can follow. And this is available for any non-company charity with income of less than 250,000. That is, that will also include the uh, CIOs. It's just anything that's not registered with Companies House. Other unincorporated associations may be able to do the receipts and payments, um, but it would be down to whatever your governing document says. The other way to prepare accounts is the accruals concept, and this would consider the invoice income and billed expenditure, regardless of whether it's been paid in the year. You will need to follow the specific requirements of FRS 102 and the SORP, uh, if it's a charity. SORP is a, a statement of recommended practice, 
it says the word recommended, but it's not, it's mandatory. Uh, so there's a little bit more work if you're a charity. And this would be applicable to all companies and any unincorporated charities and CIOs with income above 250,000. As a charity, you would also need to prepare a trustees report and the requirements under the accruals accounts are a little bit more in depth than as a receipts and payments accounts. Other considerations on the format of the accounts would be the governing document, as I've already said, but also funders. Sometimes funders may request that you prepare accounts under the accruals concept, so that's worth bearing in mind. And fund accounting, which is applicable to charities. If you are trying to do some fundraising appeals and the money's for a specific project, you'll need to record that separately within the books of prime entry and the accounts and then any associated expenditure would need to be recorded separately as well. Uh, can you go on to, please? Also around the year end, we'll have to consider whether any external scrutiny is required of those accounts. So audit is the higher level of assurance and essentially the auditor will issue a report that says these accounts are free from material misstatement whereas the independent examination is a much lower level of assurance, but it's still something. And it is uh, the reports worded along the lines of, from the work done, nothing has come to our attention to suggest that these accounts differ to the accounting records. An audit of a charity is required when your income is above 1 million or your turnover is above 250,000 with assets above 3.26 million. If you are a company and not a charity, they will be required for any entity that is not considered a small company. Small companies are those that don't meet two of the following, so less than 10 million pounds turnover, 5.1 million pounds assets, or less than 50 employees. Most clubs that we come into contact with, we can ignore the company's audit thresholds because they don't get quite that high, but it's the charity ones that are more applicable. And if your governing document specifies you need to have an audit, then one must be done. It's worth bearing in mind though that the governing documents can be changed if needed to remove the requirement. The independent examination is required for any charity with income above uh, 25,000 pounds or where the governing document specifies it needs to be done. If the income of the club is above 250,000, it must be done by a member of a recognized body such as a chartered accountant or a certified chartered accountant, amongst others. Tax consequences then, uh, primarily around the, the year end of the requirements that you, you'd have to do. Charities generally don't pay tax on most types of income on the basis that it is used for charitable purposes. And by charitable purposes, I mean what it's doing for the public benefit is charitable objects. So any income you receive that is not spent on charitable purposes will likely be liable to tax. Other uh, income such as property, uh, profits from land or property development will be liable to tax. Thinking specifically about trading in a charity, there's uh, this concept called primary purpose trading. That's exempt and that's where you're trading, but the income is received solely for the primary purpose of the charity. Uh, can you move on please? then any other trading which is not considered primary purpose may be exempt if it falls within the categories there. So if your, your club's total income is less than 32,000, you can receive up to 8,000 pounds of trading income from non-primary purpose for it to be exempt. As far as companies are concerned, looking, this is companies that are not registered as CASCs as well. So if it's just a normal limited by guarantee company, generally you would have to file a corporation tax return annually with any tax payable within nine months and one day. There may be certain exemptions you can claim from income such as donations because it's outside of the remit of tax, but you need to look specifically at the income streams that are coming in as to whether any liability will arise. Unincorporated associations, so things that aren't registered with companies' house, um, tax status largely depends on the income received and the governing document, mostly around this mutual trading concept. 
whereby you can't earn a taxable trade by trading with yourself and the members are all part of the same entity. So money from the membership income would not be subject to tax, but it depends on the governing document. So that means non-member income, investment income, property income may be taxable. But as a CASC, you can claim specific exemptions um, from tax on the bank interest, gift aid donations, member income, trading profits if they're less than 50,000, and income from property up to £30,000 a year, as well as the capital gain. So there's clearly some benefits to registering as a CASC as well. The key thing to remember is not-for-profit does not mean not-for-tax. It's looking at specific income streams and whether or not any exemptions can be claimed for that particular thing. VAT, I'll put it right at the top there, very complex area, far more information than I can try to cover in the 10 to 15 minutes that we've got today. Um, essentially, the, the rules are the same regardless of what governance structure you go for. Yes, charities can receive certain exemptions, but that's because of the income that it's receiving. So income from grants may be vatable or may not be vatable. It depends how the grant is actually worded and whether the funder is getting something in return for the money they're giving. So if the vatable income for any entity goes above 85,000, you may be liable to registering for VAT. As a club, a charity, whatever it may be, there's other reliefs that can be available, such as the new sports buildings. You can claim to reduce the VAT you pay for contractors' costs from the standard 20% down to 0% and zero rate if you meet a specific set of criteria. So it's worth looking into that considerations and any large payments that are likely to be made. But, and I highly recommend that you seek specialist that advice on the matter. Gift aid can be claimed by charities and CASCs, and it's a separate registration you must do with HMRC. So as Alan said, you would set up and then register with HMRC. At that point, you're not automatically entitled to claim gift aid. You would have to fill out a separate form, which is a CHA1. And once you do that, then you can start reclaiming the gift aid and gift aid, you can get 25% back on every one pound that's donated. I think it's important to remember that as a club, you can't reclaim gift aid on membership fees. Gift aid can only be reclaimed on freely given donations. So whereas membership income, the members get something in return, it's outside the remit, as are uh, things such as raffles. So if you do a collection for a raffle and there's a prize at the end, doesn't matter how small the prize is, that income could not be uh, gift aided. So I appreciate there's probably quite a lot of information that I've gone into in the last 10, 11 minutes or so. Um, but thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions that you may have towards the end. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is John Thorpe. I'm a trustee of a body called the Unstyle Village Centre Trust. Uh, the trust itself uh, was established in 2015. I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a moment. But what we're involved in is actually building a, a community building in, uh, in Anstein, Mid-Sussex. It is a sports pavilion, but it's also a village hall. Um, we are delivering a joint project at the insistence of really the district council uh, and some of our funders who were very keen on, on, on a joint project. So it has thrown up a number of complex governance issues, not least because we're dealing with several parties and there are legal issues involved as, as well. I'm, I'm not going to go through those today. Um, wouldn't even try to go through them, but uh, uh, Alan knows about these. Um, I'm not, I'm going to talk about funding also. I'm not an expert on, on fundraising. I, I've not got a background in, in fundraising, uh, but I have been the fundraiser on this project so I can share that experience. Uh, I think there's also a point about relevance. Most of our fundraising, all of our fundraising, really was done um, pre pre COVID. We, we pulled all our funding together at the end of 2019. So I'll take you through an overview of, of, of that journey as well. So, and I do know that some of the funds that we are we we have benefited from are not available now as well. So, uh, so in some specific comments, might not be really particularly particularly useful. But before 
before I get into that, I just might show you just a little bit of, of what this project is. So that's, that's the, well, here's the building as was. So we were faced with the Anstey Recreation Ground, which is where we play our crickets and football. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a village hall adjoining the, the, the recreation ground. And that's where um, over a hundred years ago, uh, a, a former World War I army hut was, was procured to, for the first Anstey village, village Hall. And that was extended in, in, 2000, uh, in 1953 to, to put on a social club. And then in 2000, uh, 1973, I beg your pardon, to put on sports changing and, 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 uh, and, and a snooker room uh, for, for, for the teams playing on the recreation ground. And as you can see, it's, it's somewhat dilapidated and, and, and the old village hall is, is, is collapsing. Uh, so in any event, what Mid Sussex said that they would do was they were quite keen to replace this and wanted it replacing. And they've actually given us a plot of, of land, as you can see from the photograph on the bottom, uh, on the recreation ground itself. So we're actually building the new centre on the recreation ground. And the plan is that the old centre that you can see, uh, the old village hall and, and, and social club will be demolished uh, sometime next year uh, to create an extended an extended car park. So so that's that's what we're seeking seeking to do. Um, and maybe in the next slide, please, Scott, just to show a little bit more about the project. So. This is uh, the, the slide in the bottom left hand corner is just about where we are now. Uh, we've got the roof on. Uh, we did get hit by COVID. We, the, the building program was, uh, it didn't stop, but the uh, construction of the timber frame didn't go forward as, as we'd had hoped. Uh, the, the, the factory was closed. So that has cost us time and has led us to renegotiate uh, our funding uh, and aspects of our funding with, with, with funders. And I, I have to say that our funders have been first rate, um, been really, really helpful. However, we had one particularly tricky aspect in that we've got European community funding in this project and they wanted, uh, uh, the, the requirement of those funds was, was everything had to be, affect the project had to be delivered and audited and completed by the end of this calendar year, which we're clearly not going to do. Uh, but we've managed with discussions through West Sussex County Council and the Rural Payments Agency to, to, to win another quarter in, in, into 2021 to actually get the job, job done. So we're still under pressure, but it does mean that we can access that funding. So the uh, post-COVID, uh, we suspended work on the piling, basically groundworks. Uh, Pre-COVID, the groundworks had been done. When COVID hit, uh, the piling didn't move forward that was stopped for about four weeks and then we couldn't so we couldn't do the concrete pour so uh, essentially we, we really started to come out of the ground when we did the, the concrete pour and then thereafter we the timber frame has gone up as you can see you get a good view onto the recreation ground from uh, from on the bottom right hand picture which shows you uh, the first main ground we've got another cricket ground and football pitch over those hedges as well so essentially that's that's what we're doing so I'll, if you don't mind i'll just take you through a little bit of the chronology and then i'll talk about funding if that's okay so Stuart, uh, scott if you could move on sorry so i've gone through most of this so the you know 1921 is when we when we started but what is probably sort of most relevant here is the the joint project really started to take shape in 2013. Uh, we we danced around this from around 2011 when, when, when Mid Sussex had told us how they wanted the project to go forward, the ECB and other other sponsors were really quite keen for this as well. They thought it was uh, the right thing to do. Um, so we signed a, a project initiation document with Mid Sussex uh, in 2013, which set out three objectives. One was to set up a governance structure. The second was to develop a de design that was sympathetic to the environment and met the uh, objectives of, of all the parties that were captured there. And also to come up with uh, and, uh, a scheme for the possession of the site. I won't go into that. That's very complex in terms of the different freehold interests that, that sit around this project and how that was to be done and, and, and a way of working, working through that, which we have a scheme, but we're actually still implementing, in, implementing that at, at the moment. But the key thing, I think, for this discussion, coming back to Alan's presentation, is that we, this is when we, we started to work with Wix and Kay. And certainly with all the charitable interests we uh, it wasn't just a sports club we were dealing with we were dealing with a community center so we went down the charitable in, uh, incorporated organization route and 
frankly, that has served us very well. Um, and Alan made the point about the sort of stiffer regulation in that environment, but I'm, as an ex-auditor and, uh, and an accountant, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with all of that. And I think actually it, the, these things put a discipline on, on entities in the way in which they operate and how they need to think about their operations, which I think is, is, really, is really very positive. And, I, and the model that we've got uh, set up in 2015, it's now been there for five years. And I think it's working, working well for us. And I think you know, the, the, the route that we took when we, when we spoke to Alan was, was, was actually the right, the right thing to do. Uh, we got planning permission on the design in 2017 and undertook sort of tendering. Uh, but from 2015 right the way through to the current day, and I still am fundraising. We are still working on bringing funds into this project. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Alistair talked about, you know, one of the key things for us was to get zero rating on the, uh, uh, on, on the build itself. We actually secured that in 2019. But we did take advice on that. We were working with a, a VAT partner and I think developed a very strong case for our project and a very clear one. But we weren't able to get a binding decision until we were able to tell the, rev the revenue precisely who was going to do the project, what it was going to cost. But, but that was straight, you know, straightforward. Uh, and then last year was really, whilst we got a lot of interest from funders, we were working from turning pledge funds of, of, of different levels of, of uh, um, commitment really into 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 properly committed funds and that went right the way through from sort of april through to through to december we started the project we actually the build the first the shovel went into the ground on the 8th of january uh five days before the planning commission ran out so this has been a bit of a white knuckle ride just to get this over uh, uh, over the line and get and get it started um so we're scheduled now given the the, the covid um challenge and working through that we will now complete next February hopefully at which point we will demolish the village hall uh, and uh, the sits behind we have a month to do that the sits behind the building and then get into extending the car park which might take a little bit longer because we want to revisit the design of that and we've whilst we, we have an idea of where the funding is going to come from it may take time for that to come to come through so if I just finish off by talking a little bit about funding so I, I think the the biggest lesson for me from this project, and as I say, I wasn't an expert. I, I mean, somebody reminded me the other day when I mentioned I was going to get involved in this talk and said, well, do you remember when we were sat on the train? I, I was commuting to London and this must have been around 2011, 2012, and one or two of us who were on the, in the cricket club met on the train and we started talking about it. And somebody overheard us and he said, I couldn't help hearing what you were saying. And it sounds all very interesting. He said, but I've just delivered a similar project. And he says, well, uh, the only advice I'd give you is just, he just uh, take your time scales and triple them or even quadruple them. Because it will take you a lot longer than you think in order to draw all this stuff together. And frankly, he, he, was, he was right. Um, so we first, on the signing of the, of the project initiation document and the presentation of the first business plan for the building, uh, we, we did get some funding from the district council um, that's section 106 money, which has uh, um, uh, got us along the way and, and, and made us feel very, 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 very positive. The, a local charity, the Climewalk Tr Trust, uh, has uh, supported the project and had already given some money quite early on to the village hall, and we were able to improve on that uh, a little. And that, and that was, uh, you know, partly because they had already got an association with the project. That wasn't necessarily so difficult. But then the rest of it was was really quite a hard slog um, and sort of building a relationship with the funders and taking time to actually demonstrate to them that we had a project that was deliverable um, because they were hugely skeptical. Uh, you know, uh, the governance initially was, you know, it's very difficult getting all the parties to work together within within the trust and, and, and to start to move it forward took a little bit of time. Um, and indeed, we, we we had a number of issues with the design brief. So we've we've only ever used one set of lawyers, but we we have had contact with four architects on this project. So it was straight, but uh, not all of them. That only two that we were really ever paid. Uh, one for a feasibility scheme, but the but the architects that we're using or the designers that we're using now were the were, were the main um, people. But trying to get somebody who would have the understanding and the ability to get their head around the brief and had enough knowledge of, of 
sports pavilions and how to set them out and, and what was needed. It took us time to identify the right, the right person. So Sport England have been a good supporter of the project. So, but having said that, we've made three applications to Sport England. We were rejected twice on the, uh, uh, the first two applications. And somewhat disappointing, I think you, you learn about your project and engagement with funders allows you to build your understanding and insight into the project. And you, sometimes I think, you know, maybe in retrospect, we were quite, quite naive in, in the early days. Um, although what was disheartening with the second rejection from, from Sport England was the rejection letter, letter read exactly the same as the first one. And you just felt that people hadn't read the, the, the application properly. Uh, for some reason, uh, anyway, they opened a new fund called the Community Asset Fund. And we thought, oh, this is really speaks directly to what we're trying to do here. And uh, we did get some success there. And, and then Sport England really did kick in and, and were really very good for us. Uh, you could tell immediately that they were interested in the project. They started asking questions, asking for more information even got involved in the in the design. Um, the ECB, who were working uh, our major sport is cricket, uh, ECB said to me, we only know of two projects in the country that have ever got any money out of Sport England or the Community Asset Fund, and they never get more than 50,000. So don't claim for more than 50,000. Don't, don't ask for more than that. Although they, we could have gone for 75. Uh, and the good news was that Sport England came back and said, no, we like your proposal so much that we'd like to give you 75,000 because we think you've got a challenge here and we'd like to, to support that. And, and they've been very good throughout. I mean, from the point of getting the award, they've been really quite relaxed and, uh, uh, and um, um, you know, a very sort of supportive uh, sponsor of the project. England and the Wales Cricket Board were, um, have, have given us significant support in the end and uh, at one point when we really didn't think we were going to get the project away in in early 2019 um, we called them for a meeting and they came and saw us and and we spent some time working through uh, through the project with them and they'd already got a pretty good understanding uh, and they came, wrote to me in July to say no we really do want to support the project we think you you know particularly for the women's cricket that we deliver uh, and and the sort of diversity in our cricket program they really wanted to to you know to get behind it so uh that that was great and that was really important to us because given that 66 percent of the footfall on the site is cricket we really did need the ecb to be at the table um and once they were i think that that you know that helped helped a lot uh, it, interestingly while sport england generally are, are accepting their applications through a web-based interface so they you, you're allowed to uh, uh, apply to them uh, so almost directly we were never actually allowed to put anything into into the ecb system until we'd actually got a decision in principle that they wanted to support the project at which point we started to make the application which is rather rather strange but that's that's how it how it worked um the third one on there uh, is i think it's worth commenting on although it's not accessible anymore but this is the rural development program for england the leader funds where we've got the maximum amount that we could have got through them which is seventy five thousand. um where we because of our rural location uh, we're just on just outside Haywards Heath and Burgess Hill uh, we were able to play to play that card um, again a very different experience with with you know with leader um, the application process very challenging 40 odd pages of on the application form and I, I was liaising with another club that had, had, had got this a club in Oxfordshire who had, had got leader support and there chairman described the application like a, a university dissertation it was just so demanding um, and in fact the staff were very helpful um, to us at West Sussex County Council uh, really spent some time talking to us and helping us to make the best application that we could uh, when we were successful they were almost apologetic about the, the what we had to jump through but given the central government interest and given at that point the well the European interest uh, they really did have to make sure that every every I was dotted and, and T was T was crossed, but I actually found that was it was really quite an important stage in the project. So we start, started on that application in 2018, uh, didn't put it forward in 2018 because it wasn't mature enough and there was we hadn't got all the other funding together. But what 
the leader experience it was it really went through our business case really tightly and really made us think about what we were trying to deliver what our outputs were going to be what our outcomes were going to be where the public and alan mentioned public benefit where the public benefit was going to be uh, and that challenge i found really extremely extremely useful um, but i shouldn't really move on with <laughs> conclude this without talking about the district council and the parish council at the end of the day you know over 50 percent of our funding just over 50 percent has come from the district council and the parish council uh, we've been able to, which other clubs will not be able to do necessarily, take advantage of quite a lot of development that's going on in Mid Sussex and within the parish where we are located, uh, building development. And so we've been able to access, access Section 106 money, which has been really is the foundation of all of our funding. So you know, it, 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 it's really very helpful to start a conversation up with a potential funder in the knowledge that you've got 50 to 60 percent of your funds already or they're already pledged and that makes those you know the, it does actually allow you to get through the door um the frustration with section 106 funding is the parish the district council make allocations on what you should spend the money on without ever consulting you so reconciling our project and our expenditure with the tranches of section 106 monies that are available or potentially available has been a bit of a a bit of a headache and that has presented one or two sort of cash flow challenges for us uh, and the parish council came in uh, with they'd already got some funds in reserves and this is a big project for the parish so they 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 came in uh, having been on the inside of the project for a long long time we actually only got their money actually formally pledged to us in uh, committed to us in October and December was really very hectic because the main tranche of section 106 and some another facilities grant from from the parish district council i beg your pardon wasn't actually ratified until the 19th of december in the same week we got approval on a very significant package from the ecb which had to go to board level uh, and this was a matter of days before the christmas holidays and getting getting the contractor on site so one of the biggest challenges that, that we experienced was actually just getting through that final quarter and getting through december um, with a with uh, you know that type timetable and and the prospect of not getting uh, not getting a shovel into the ground uh, uh, before the planning approval ended so that yeah so there we are so in you know my experience in terms of funding um it, it varies really for every funder has got a a different approach and different priorities as you can imagine and probably saw more of that because we had sport community and local authority funding in this anyway uh, and one of the things that i you know i've drawn from this is is that you've really got to have your core case your numbers your rationale and your business case has really got to be solid because it's, it's got to point in different directions and the way in which you analyze that or pitch that to different people you have to have that sort of continuity so and bearing in mind as well that your numbers will evolve as well so you know costs your your best estimates may not be right uh, there will be unforeseen issues and i think probably uh, i talked about you know the first lesson it takes a lot of time i think the second lesson is 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 it, it doesn't i think it's really around around uh, what we'd call optimism bias uh, and i think and uh, in my old job we used to talk about this as being a sort of a plague of projects and i can see this in in our project that we we kind of always thought on the positive side that things would happen and probably didn't give enough thought to where would things could go wrong and so you know on, on reflection i don't think we made enough provision for contingency uh i i you know and those, those those sorts of things so we've had one or two things to deal with and we're still seeking to deal with we will we will deliver the project but it does mean that throughout the delivery of the project you're still working on funding because you haven't necessarily anticipated everything that's going to going to hit you so that's uh, i'll probably leave it there scott if that's okay and take questions if that's uh, if people have any questions thanks john uh, that was really interesting and i think some really valuable lessons from all of the three speakers there um through those talks uh, and some first-hand accounts uh, which i hope are relevant to some of the people uh, listening this evening I'm uh, going to wrap up. We've had um, just the one question at, in actually, which I will put out, um, and it's one for Alan. Um, so, uh, Alan, you can come in here. Uh, before I ask this, this is actually related to um, probably more related to employment law. 
um, and Rick's okay, does have an employment law team, so we may pick this one up afterwards. But let me put this to Alan in any case, and it's re it's regarding restricted membership um, of club setup, and whether or not restricted membership clubs have to uh, adhere to the Equalities Act and in, and indeed probably other uh, uh, protected uh, statuses and that that type of thing. Have you have you got any view on that, Alan? Or is that more one for yeah, our employment team? No, very happy to take the question, Scott. Uh, I think the question came out from my comment on clubs which are neither uh, charities nor CASCs and one of the, my comments there was that you can have a restricted membership. What I was trying to do is get across the distinction between that and a CASC and probably the charities as well in that for a CASC what is you ha the, the membership has to be open to all and that is to say uh, good players, bad players, uh, all levels of players, um, you can't you can't restrict the membership in any way whatsoever. Uh, contrasted with a just a club, which isn't a cask, just a group of people playing a game of rugby or whatever together, uh, where you could have a restricted membership. Say you have to be an extremely good uh, elite uh, rugby player, elite athlete to be a member of the club, whereas with a cask you can't. But to answer the direct question, does the Equalities Act etc. apply to uh, those sorts of uh, clubs, clubs which aren't charities and clubs without cash. Yes, sure they do. I'm not a, I'm not a equal opportunities uh, expert. Far from it. Um, but yes, I'm sure it does apply. Thanks, Alan. And uh, I said only one question to come in. We've had a few more now. Um, and just picking up on the theme of cask and CIC. Uh, I don't know if you can see those questions there, Alan, but let me read this one out to you. So is CASC uh, similar to community interest company, CIC? Um, and can an area league association or the organisation that runs the competition, um, i.e. a club, um, become a CASC? Uh, right, let's get his CASC similar to a community interest company. Uh, they are different. A CASC uh, community community amateur sports club is specifically for sport specifically aimed at sport uh, its regulator if you like is HMRC community interest company uh, tends to be more what you might call I suppose social benefit uh, it might be setting up a business of some sort but with a very much with a community type uh, goal aim common good type aim it's not a charity. So similar, yes, different focus, different focus. One is sport and one tends to be more um, uh, business type, community business type uh, entities, if that helps. Um, I'm sure it does, yeah, thank you. And just picking up the last one on uh, incorporated structures. Um, is it a requirement of the Charity Commission for trustees of a CIO to rotate after nine years? or can they stay in the role indefinitely? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, it is considered to be good practice for no trust for a trustee to serve no longer than three years. Typically, it's thought to be good practice to stand for terms of three years and then to be stand down, uh, be re-elected if that's the view of the members. But yes, maximum period of time is the maximum, maximum recommended period is nine years. But there is no law that says as such. It's simply considered to be good practice. Uh, uh, I have, I've been a trustee of a, a small charity down in Dorset for about 31 or two years. And there's no reason why I can't continue. There are particular circumstances around that, but it's uh, it's it's thought to be good practice to move on after nine years certainly thanks alan and uh, just bringing in john we've got one on uh and yep. i um, if that's okay john um yep. what are the medium to long-term post project risks um with regards to the viability and the sustainability of the business business model for and uh, really looking at things like maintenance of the new clubhouse uh, and things like that have you got have you got that far yet <laughs> Oh yes, we, well we have, and it's a very good question. Um, and have we got further to go? We 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 certainly got further to go. Um, in terms of looking at, uh, we've we've looked at sort of before and after, and and, and the sort of the levels of usage that we need to achieve in the centre, 
um, to the, uh, the amount of time that the village hall is booked out, the amount of time the club room is is under use. Um, looking at footfall and 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 how we uh, address address all of those issues. So those things are in in the plan. I think one of the things that uh, uh, and I probably won't surprise you that some people regard the uh, uh, some people regard the building of the building as as the project it isn't actually. And I think this is where the, the business planning and working with uh, external partners and funders has, has helped us to say really think hard about your outputs and outcomes and how you're going to get there and on and, and what's and what's in you know, what's involved. Uh, so we have got uh, in terms of sort of a good sort of uh, base uh, program in terms of around cricket in terms of you know, a strong sort of cricket membership and a, a strong girls section but we are thinking very hard about actually how do we maintain that and how do we grow that uh, uh, and equally we're doing the same with with all the sort of sport on the site so we're actually working through that now with the football club as well in terms of uh, making sure that those programs actually work and we and we get even even investing in the football field to make sure that games don't get called off uh, through a water pitches and things like that so the you know the, the success of this is actually going to be around you know being able to run sport on the site and then people staying on on site uh, to use uh, you know to the, uh, the the facilities equally in the village hall uh, the traditional model uh, as, as you might have seen uh, has, has been very sort of passive um, just waiting for people to come along and, and, and hire it and I think actually if you want the village hall to work and you want to deliver a program uh, of community activity and we're very keen on bringing quite a lot of sport and exercise onto the site um, and those types of classes, then you've really got to identify your partners quite early, I think, and start working with them and develop develop those programs. So uh, it, it requires much more sort of active active management. In terms of viability, so we've got clearly there are we 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 don't know how it's going to work precisely. I can assure you that in the first eighteen to twenty four to thirty six months of this project, we will be sitting on top of the income and and, and expenditure. Uh, flows really closely and just making sure that we understand what's going on what it, truly what does it cost to run the new building where are ex expectations right are we are we putting the right amount of money into into the sort of the sinking fund for maintenance and everything else but equally are the are the income streams performing as we we absolutely need them need them to so uh, you know that's an issue that's been complicated through you know through covid so we are quite anxious about getting to a position next spring when in actual fact we can't actually deliver the programs that we want but we've even looked at how we can uh, fortunately the village hall is well ventilated and you know whether we can actually uh, that would allow us to to still to deliver classes that are socially distanced and how many people would be in those classes i, I you know so i don't know so we we're thinking through that but we've got to do quite a lot of work in the next few weeks just sort of testing that out uh, fortunately as i say we did at the end of last summer we were able to get cricket on and that was a great success even though we couldn't use the changing rooms the cricket program was really strong and it, it, it gave us confidence that uh, hopefully in 2021 even if we can't use the facilities to the full there'll be a lot of activity on on, on the recreation ground and crucially we can keep the bar open and, uh, and 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 you know so those that income stream is protected as well but uh no we think uh, you know the first two to three years of this project when post build is going to be quite crucial in terms of you know, how we take it forward i would also say that even on the sporting side we're not actually just simply going to deliver the sport as is so we're working with the Sussex cricket foundation and trying to develop a project and how we can diversify into disability cricket and just and also working with local charities who uh, basically deal with sort of disadvantaged children in, in local schools and say that actually can we can the facilities be used to actually introduce uh, them either those people to sport or introduce them to you know to other things so uh, we're, we're working on that I mean for that to be viable we would need to attract possibly some external funding to actually achieve that but we're you know, we're, we are we are thinking about that as well so I don't think fundraising for the Anstey Village Centre will stop post-build. I think it will. It will continue. Thanks, John. Um, 
we've had we've had a few uh, more questions in actually and i'm conscious of time i'm going to pick up on on just one more before we sign off but I, I i will make sure that all of the other questions are responded to um after the event we'll come back to you um we have the individuals that have posed those questions and of course you've got all of the details on the screen there we will circulate the slides to um all of the attendees so if you do want to contact either alan alistair or john then please do drop them an email. I know they'll be um, more than happy to answer your queries. Just gonna take one, one quick question before we sign off. This is for Alan. Um, and it's coming back to um, if sports club, clubs become incorporated as a limited company, uh, is there actually any role left for trustees um, or does that now all fall to the directors um, of the company who will presumably make the decisions on behalf of the club? Um, have you got a quick answer for that one, Alan? And then we'll, uh, we'll sign off, I think. Sure. All comes down to terminology and terminology in this area is an absolute nightmare. Uh, I assume the question is aimed at if a, if a sports club wants to incorporate as a limited company and be, be also be a charity. Uh, if that is the question, then the terminology is that trustees are directors, directors are trustees. The two terms are interchangeable for a company limited by guarantee, which is also a charity but uh, terminology here in this area, extremely confusing, frankly, uh, and great care needed to make sure you're using the right terminology. Trustees will be the directors, the directors will be the trustees. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, okay, I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar. It's been a really interesting uh, uh, session from my point of view at least um, and I hope everyone else has benefited from the speakers like I said do get in touch with Alan Alastair or John if you, if you want to ask some questions I'm sure they'd be delighted to um, you know give you pointers um, and tips and how you can move forward your own projects of incorporation or whatever it might be uh, we'll come back to the other questions as well um, uh, later in the week uh, probably tomorrow I hope uh, so thanks for joining um, that's all from us and we hope you enjoyed the session uh, and good evening <laughs>